thank you so much for that introduction, Jason. So Gordy and I are, are gonna be splitting this presentation time and I'll be starting us off and Gordy will take on um, the presentation after that. We're gonna start this talk um, by kind of reviewing a bit more about wildfire processes. So one question that we have is that, what does wildfire do to aquatic systems? Does it reset aquatic habitat or is it a catastrophe? So <clears throat> we know that wildfire is a significant disturbance at landscape scales. Historically, in the Western United States, wildfire was probably the single most important natural disturbance process that shaped the complexity, the distribution, and the diversity of aquatic and terrestrial habitats. So even as we have worked to suppress wildfire, recent decades have demonstrated that wildfires will continue to occur and that they are getting more extreme, points that were made earlier by Tim in his presentation. This figure is from the Global Forest Watch website, and it um, shows us the fires and the fire alerts uh, generated using uh, remotely sensed imagery over just a three month period in 2020. So we can see that fires are a significant process still across our landscapes and um, becoming more of a, a, a question and an issue in BC for sure. So in the US, <clears throat> we've seen fire size and intensity coupled with a longer wildfire season. So these observations of wildfire extent and frequency reflect a complex array of circumstances that have changed the amount of fuels and moisture across the landscape. This, the result of this more intense fire season really has been catastrophic for some of our rural communities and remote homes, as well as for some wildfire that were caught in the wrong place at the wrong time. I point out though, that the wildfire suppression that we've done in the past um, likely was far more effective than it, it is today, reflecting how we have changed our landscapes and that soil moisture content, but also how our climate has changed um, significantly over this last several decades. So how did we get here? How did we get to this place? Well, in the US, it likely begins with European colonization that impeded native people from setting the fires that they had for generations that reduced fire severity and, en and enhanced the food plants as well as the forage for native deer, elk, and bison that they depended on. So the policy of wildfire suppression that followed has allowed fuels to accumulate in places that historically burned more frequently. So in the Western US, this is coupled with commercial logging practices that removed the largest, most fire resistant trees with the deepest bark. The absence of fire allowed more fire sensitive trees to grow and the absence of large trees led to the development of even aged and relatively uniform stands of forest. The uniformity of these stands meant that we lost the landscape mosaic that was comprised of open stands and different ages of trees that created natural fire breaks. And now climate is changing, drying many parts of our Western landscapes creating ideal conditions for the development of megafires. So of all these drivers of wildfire change, I wanna spend a few minutes really digging into this concept of landscape mosaics because they have um, a significant role to play both in wildfire, but also aquatic habitats. So these two photos are from the Mission Peak area on the Okanagan Wenatchee National Forest in North Central Washington State. The top photo is from 1934, and we can see a mosaic with different sizes and densities of trees with visible gaps on this landscape. So the south facing hillsides um, contain extensive meadow environments that are visible in this picture. <clears throat> 
This area of Western Washington state is dry and historically experienced frequent mixed severity fires every 15 to 50 years or so. This contrasts with the same location nearly 80 years later. So many of the gaps that were previously meadows are filled in. We see uniform ages of trees visible across the landscape. And many of the trees that are grown in here are of species that are less fire um, tolerant than the historic forest. And they've been able to develop due to fire suppression and ongoing forest practices. So we have essentially lost the mosaic of open space and different tree densities that we saw in 1934. So what really have we lost by changing that landscape mosaic? This is, these are figures from um, a forest analysis done by Tom Spees and his co-authors in 2018. This was done in the Lower Grand Ronde Subbasin located in the Blue Ridge Mountains of Northeastern Oregon. So the upper four figures are reconstructed historical conditions from the 1900s that describe forest structure, forest fuel loading, crown fuel potential, and flame length. The same categories are, sh are shown in the bottom four figures there um, that our current, our current assessment of forest conditions. So the darker red or warm colors are associated with early stand initiation for those forest stand structure um, mosaics with forest fuel, with high fuel loading and very high to severe crown fuel potential or flame length. So what we can see in this analysis is the effect of wildfire suppression and forest harvest over the long term. That's essentially homogenized the current landscape, resulting in more uniform young trees with high fuel loading that have very high crown fuel potential and associated high flame lengths. So this contrasts with that historic landscape where the characteristics of the fire are um, where the characteristics of the fire are, are quite different. So we can see that there are areas of low intensity fuel interspersed with areas of high intensity, essentially blocking the movement and spread of fires. So that historic mosaic reflected a millennia of natural and native people's fire events. Um, and I, I can't stress how important that historical knowledge was that they brought to, um, to the management of the landscape that helped them to live in fire prone landscapes. Um, I would also point out that complex mosaics of terrestrial landscapes and forest systems are often linked with complex mosaics of aquatic habitats as well. So our forests and our landscapes are strongly tied to the diversity of habitats that we see in streams. So as we have changed the fire interval and fire behavior on our landscapes, we've influenced the behavior of fire and its influence on aquatic habitats as well. So for the last century, the focus in the US has been on wildfire suppression and we can see that the consequences of that today are not necessarily what we would have hoped for, particularly as our climate has changed, making our landscapes more vulnerable to wildfire. And by suppressing fire, we have increased the amount of fuels on our landscape. We are seeing this intersection then between climate and management that's resulting in um, hazards for, for homes, for loss of livestock and communities. There's also a perception that fire has negative impacts on fish and fish habitat. The idea that fire is always bad for fish and fish habitat contributed to the perspective that we needed to control fire and always control fire. But the idea then that clean streams with sparkling water 
our ideal for people are the ideal that we would want for people, for wildlife, and for fishes is a very common perspective. Certainly, wildfire can be messy. It contributes fine sediment, but it also contributes other materials that make stream water um, after fire uh, in the short term more turbid, but can also contribute those building blocks for complex habitat over the long term. So while our short term effects may negatively um, affect uh, municipal water supplies or aquatic habitat in localized areas, the component of this, of this, the, this puzzle here is what happens to these systems over time? How does wildfire contribute to complex landscape mosaics? And how do streams become complex? How is that linked to our landscape mosaic? So the role of disturbance and particularly of wildfire is complicated and it may not always give us the intuitive answers that we might be expecting. So emerging science and research that is often opportunistic in nature has begun to paint a picture of the interactions between wildfire, native fish, disturbance processes, and aquatic habitats. So recent research indicates that riparian areas often differ from upslope areas in terms of vegetation, composition, microclimate, and fuels, leading to potentially different fire environments and return intervals. In several studies, riparian areas were shown to burn with lower intensity wildfire, acting as potential fire breaks and refuge for wildlife. The natural regeneration of vegetation may also be quicker in riparian areas compared to upslope environments. Sometimes surprising physiological adaptive responses by, by native plants, animals, and fishes point to the long-term relationship between native biota who evolved in disturbance-prone landscapes. There is an emerging view in the scientific community that characteristic wildfires may not necessarily be negative for fish and aquatic ecosystems over time. In fact, periodic fires may contribute to the long-term persistence of fish populations. As we have fire-adapted trees and vegetation, so too are we finding natural adaptations in fish populations, allowing them to survive and thrive in the years following wildfire. There are certainly limits to this, of course, such as when populations of a species or subspecies are restricted to small areas or isolated from other populations. The observations in the literature lead to perhaps an alternative view. First, that wildfire is a natural process. And second, that fish populations have persisted for the millennia in fire and disturbance prone landscapes. Gordy is gonna take it from here and share some of this science and ideas about how fire management and fish habitat management can be related. So Gordy, why don't you take, take it from here? Okay, um, thanks Becky. And I wanna, uh, before I begin, thank the organizers for the invitation to participate in this. I think uh, these conferences are really important. And I think one of the reasons is to discuss um, our perspectives on um, of wildfire. And I think Becky's done a nice good job here of setting the stage for uh, us providing a, a, a way of thinking about these alternatives. And so can we have the next slide, please? Uh, well, go back one, please. Okay, there you go. You know, uh, it's interesting to listen, listen to the language. To, uh, um, go back one. There we go, that one, yeah. Um, the language, you know, fire has been described as disturbance and there's negative effects. Um, but as Becky pointed out, this is a natural process and it, it's been occurring for a long time. And if we step back and um, go beyond the immediate impacts, what we see is, is that these systems are well adapted, most systems are well adapted to fire as are the organisms that are uh, the aquatic organisms found in them. So this is just an example of, of looking at uh, the various processes that play out uh, over time following fire. This is from work by Jason Dunham and others in 2003. And you see that, um, you know, there's some initial effects here in terms of um, uh, input of materials, 
But over time, what we're seeing is these systems actually become more productive. We see, you know, we see a decline in the suspended sediment. We're seeing out, we're seeing uh, woody debris increasing. Primary production is, is increasing in those early years, and we see a, a, a flourishing of the invertebrate assemblages. And associated with that are, are the fish. Now, this is just a, a, a generalization, but if we can get beyond the initial um, observations or the initial concerns that we see from fire, the effect of potential effect of fire, what we see is that these systems actually become very productive. Next slide, please. And here's an example of how fish are adapted to um, uh, to the effect of fire. This is a response of native of, of resident rainbow trout. This is in Idaho. Uh, some work by Amanda Rosenberger, Jason Dunham, and others, looking at the 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 response in terms of growth rate, and we'll see here in, in terms of sexual reproduction here in a second. Um, and you see is that what we what we see, and now this is areas that were unburned, burned, and then burned with these major disturbances. Uh, landslide, um, erosion, so on. And what you see is, is that the biggest responses that, uh, in terms of growth occur in the most disturbed areas. Uh, it's not, you know, I think most people would say it would be the negative that, or the opposite, that unburned would be the better, uh, uh, the better habitat. But it turned out that this disturbance is resetting these systems and making them actually allowing for increases in productivity and the fish are able to take advantage of that. Next slide. This is the same study. It looks at the um, at ages of maturity. And what you see is it is in the in the fire in the fire prone system or the fire affected system, what you're seeing is is that the the fish are becoming mature earlier. At, at, and at larger rates. And again, this is this is a reflection of an adaptation. You're in a, in a highly dynamic environment. You want to be able to re reproduce as quickly as possible and as effectively as you can. And what this is showing is both in the males and the females, in those most disturbed systems, you see the, the fastest re response. So this is the, one of the mechanisms that these fish have that allows them to persist in the face of these very dynamic events. Next, next slide, please. And what this would suggest is that you know our expectations are that you know everything is going to decline, that we, we're going to see these major declines. But for example, when the thing happens, fire, we may see a decline in steelhead production, but that may be because the fish have you know. Uh, the the, rain, the resident form much more at this point. Now keep in mind that the relationship between steelhead and rainbows that each of them can re, um, produce the other life history form, and so it may be that the way that the, the anchoring, uh, you know, the um, this this particular species is persisting is to favor a particular life history form at one point in this disturbance cycle, and it may be that. The decline in steelhead is actually an adaptation of rainbow trout to the disturbance. And so we need to really, I think, temper our perspective or consider alternative explanation to some of these um, phenomena that we see or, or responses that we see to fire. Next one, please. Here's an example from some work uh, by Clint Sestridge and others in Montana where they looked at the um, response of two native species, um, uh, cutthroat and, and bull trout, as, as opposed to the invasive um, brook trout. And one of the interesting things you notice in the most disturbed system where you have the debris flows again, the brook trout population declined and never recovered. And look at what happened with those na the two native species, the West Slope cutthroat and the bull trout. They, they declined initially, but then they came back. And so it suggests that our native species are well adaptive and have the, the, the capacity to respond to these large scale events. It's not, the, uh, it's not necessarily a 
disaster, it's not necessarily negative. They are well, they're well adapted to responding and responding relatively quickly to these types of events. Next one, please. Yeah, and so this is just showing what happened with those native species. Okay, next one. So if we look at at an adverse cell monitor, then we can and our and I think we can include our resonant forms in, as well. And we ask ourselves how they how are they adapted to these these dynamic environments that include the the, <clears throat> the occurrence of fire. Well, one you know we we look at the four features here. They're genetically very flexible. They're, they're very you know um, their genetic capacity is quite high and they can adapt quite quickly. We can look at the movement of adults, or the straying of adults. Generally, straying is associated with hatchery population, but in native populations, and, um, straying is a phenomenon, and it's an important one. It allows, if you can imagine, if, you, if you've got a dynamic environment with patches moving around the landscape, what this allows the population to do is to track those patches. And, when one patch may be um, maybe lost, it, it can be recolonized by um, individual from from the more the surrounding patches. Um, they have a very high fecundity rate. In fact, for for fish that deposit eggs in the gravel, these benthic spawning fish, our native salmonids have some of the highest fecundities reported anywhere. Okay, so now they've got the ability to get to new areas, and they have the capacity to recolonize them quite quickly. The other thing we see is there's a lot of mobility among the juvenile. Um, initially, this movement was, was um, thought to be a mal uh, the less fit individuals who were unable to uh, obtain territories, and they were just you know thought to be lost from the population. But it turned out this was an, another life history uh, adaptation um, of these native fish to a very dynamic environment. You can imagine these, these fish are being moving around the landscape and looking for these patches. And so you've got the, uh, a high capacity within these native fish to respond quite quickly to these uh, and quite well to these disturbances. Next one. Um, and looking at you know, uh, Tim showed some, some of these alluvial fans. It turns out that in many cases, um, these alluvial fans can be uh, quite areas of, of, of um, uh, creating quite complex and diverse habitat. This is an example from the Boise fire. This fan came down, moved the street, stream over. You can see it starting to impinge on the road here. Uh, but this, this was quickly uh, colonized by uh, bull trout for spawning and rearing. It created a whole new environment, a whole new patch of habitat for these fish. And so you can imagine if the, if the combination of the sediment, Becky was talking about the effect of fire, if the combination of the sediment and wood that's delivered into these channels helped create this, this new environment. Okay, next one. Um, and we can begin to look at the landscape and think about where these things are gonna occur. This is some work uh, we did for the Malheur National Forest, helping them understand uh, where um, where things might happen, where erosional events and depositional events may happen following a fire, and where that where you would see the effect on the on the fish. So we can t we have these tools uh, that allow us to begin to identify where these effects are likely to play out in in the most favorable way for fish. Next one. And this is just another example of that. We look across this landscape, and if you think about, you know, the effect of fire with erosion and where you're going to see it, um, this is one where we pointed out to the forest. This is on the um, Okanagan Wenatchee National Forest, um, helping them identify priority areas for improving culverts, in increasing culverts to accommodate uh, increases in flows and passage of materials down slope. Um, following fires and where they we, where you could also begin to uh, do things with road drainage. So the idea is that we want to be able to look at this landscape and identify um, this this inherent variability that we see and use that information to help us respond 
both in terms of preparing for fire and then post fire. Next one. Uh, and this is an example of um, from some climate change work we've been doing and looking at where riparian areas are key to maintaining water temperature. Uh, and it turned out that there are certain settings, usually, you know, depending on the, the, the geomorphic setting and the stream orientation, some places of the landscape where we, if we lose vegetation, uh, we're going to see big responses in, in water temperature. In other cases, it may not be such a large change. And what you can think of is this would be used in two ways. Is one is during a fire, if you're concerned about uh, increases in water temperature, these red areas may be where you prioritize your resources to prevent the uh, damage to the riparian areas because you know you're going to get a response in terms of water temperature. Or conversely, if you're looking for post-restoration activity, you would you would begin to go into these red areas to try to get big trees back or to, to improve the shade. So again, looking at this very this inherent variability in the landscape to help you direct what, what how you maybe respond, <clears throat> fight fire and then respond to it. Next one. Um, and this is just a, a further another example of that, how you can do this on the landscape relative to uh, the various uh, types of fish that you're concerned about. Okay, next one. So is wildfire a, a threat? I, I would I think we could we could point to the literature and this is very similar to the first presentation. I think there's a lot of um, different opinions out here, but I, I think Becky and I would argue that other human influences are probably more of a threat. And you know, then climate change may override everything. But fire, if we let it play out, if, as it plays out and we don't interfere with the ecological processes, and I think that's a really key part of this, is we recognize that there are, the ecological processes are key to how, how fire is, affects the um, watershed um, can, can actually be positive in the long run. Next one. Um, I would say generally post-fire activities will not require intervention. You know, there may be for infrastructure and other things, but under the guise of um, uh, trying to interfere for the, 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 um, the sake of fish, I don't think we need to really uh, worry about that too much. Fish will do quite well. These native fish um, will do quite well in response to wildfire if we allow the system to play out, the, the ecological processes to play out. Now, there may be, as I said, there may be places that, where you want to reduce the risk because of human infrastructure <coughs> or other considerations. But for the most part, intervening for should do. Next one. And this is just showing, you know, where you, you this is some work we've done looking at erosion potential in roads. So here there may be places that we want to um, take some action to prevent the erosion. But we should right, we should keep in mind that the, in doing this, there's going to be there could be positive. We may forego some of the positive ecological uh, benefits of fire under the guise of, of providing human benefit. So it's not always it, it's not always a win-win situation. Okay, next one. Uh, and then with salvaging, you know, one of the things to keep in mind is the difference between timber harvest and fire is the legacy of those, and one of them is is the wood. And you know, oftentimes what we're seeing is a, a big influx of wood following fires, and salvage logging may reduce that. And so we need to be careful about what what we the effect of salvage logging in terms of the legacy, but where we do it. And we, again, we can look at this landscape and see places that can be done, and other places where the doing it may have negative effects. Next one. Okay, so we would argue that wildfire is a natural process. Process populations have persisted in these landscapes. Uh, and I think the key here is, as we think about the aquatic ecosystem and particularly about fish population, we need to um, 
refocus our effort from just producing more fish to a greater diversity of fish and, 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 and try to get um, genetic, life history and genetic diversity back into these populations. And that fire can be a restoration tool. Okay, so with that, I think we'll, we've hit the end and we can go to the next speaker.